My name is uh, Tariq Qureshi. I think some of you know me. Uh, I'm a regular fixture almost here in this place, uh, which is wonderful. DTEC is doing a lot of great things, and this is part of their series uh, uh, as a, uh, you know, their, their technology forums and investment forums. And uh, the format is very simple. I'll do a, a little opening for you just to sort of get your, uh, your, your juices flowing. And then a very, very uh, interactive panel discussion. We'll do the whole supply chain of retail. Uh, we won't just talk about, you know, the funky AR and VR stuff, but all the back end, uh, all the payment mechanisms that are going on, the data and analytics and stuff, and, and our customer experience. Because I think uh, those are the kinds of things that we might start losing on. I'm going to ask you a, a very difficult question. I'm going to ask you, what are the kinds of things that, is, that are going to define our future? And I ask this question because, you know, the digitization obviously is going to be there. But in your life, as we project ourselves, say, five to ten years from now, what do you think are the top two or three things that will define our future? Any feedback, any thoughts? What's going to define our future? Technology. Tech, technology? Technological changes. Technological changes. Okay, one. Anything else? What, what do you think will define your future, ma'am, in the next 10 years? The economy. The economy. Anything else? Yes, sir. Mind habits are changing. You're getting closer. Market segment of one, interesting, yes. Micro, uh, micro targeting. Yes, ma'am. How you uh, interact with other people when it's become so Interaction and the human connection getting way closer to where I'm going into the future. Yes, sir. The skills needed. All right, so I'll take this thing one stage further. So, what do you think are the top three skills? that you will need in the year 2025. You're a young man. You'll still be very young. What do you think you need in the next seven, eight, nine years? I believe more of uh, digital thinking and analysis so that type of things that are possible are more modified. Okay. So I get some vigorous nods. I will... Uh, as my, my hosts here know, I always throw out something which is completely off base. I don't think the future is about technology. Of course, technology is an integral part of, of the future. I don't think all of the things that you have mentioned are accurate. But that's not what defines us. What will define us is trust and ethics and values and empathy. You can have blockchain, but if you don't have trust, it's irrelevant. You can have biotechnology and designer babies, but if you don't have your value system and your moral compass in place, we will get lost. If we don't have empathy, we don't have customer service. The starting point is empathy. So you spoke about relationships. It's from your heart. Customer service starts from that. It's technology is an enabler. Technology is not the future. We are the future. It is us that is at the center of it not technology. And I think we keep forgetting this, that it's all about technology. No, it's all about us. And technology serves us. And as long as we can retain that principle in our head, everything we do, we will do it with humanity at its core. And as long as you have that, we have a great future. A little bit controversial first thing in the morning, but how many people now can start thinking of the alternative thought process? And so a little bit of conversion going on here. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, the other thing is that when everything starts getting so efficient, because computers are getting so efficient, analytics, data, supercomputers, and so on, the only thing that we are left with is our brain and our intelligence. Because we talk about artificial intelligence. What about our intelligence? Don't we need ours? We have stopped using our intelligence in the way that nature suggested that we should. We actually have about 10, 12, 14 intelligences in our head. How many do you think our universities want to see? Two, numerical and alphabetical. So when you do your SAT exams for your MBA program, what do they ask for your SAT scores? What do they measure? 
two things. What about emotional intelligence? What about spiritual intelligence? What about sensual intelligence? What about physical intelligence? All of these intelligences were there with us. And we are just not doing it. So when we look at a retail experience, it's not numbers or people. It's actually all of those other intelligences that actually start becoming connected to us. And our thinking process, because, and, and the, the topic here is about to AI or not to AI. This is a presentation I did at the European Economic Congress uh, in about, about a week, uh, sorry, about a month ago. And I'm just going to get a couple of extracts out of that. But what I wanted to share with you this morning was that I think we've forgotten how to think. And we're not thinking about thinking, which is metacognition. We're actually thinking about tech. And you said, you know, analytics, you need critical thinking. But if you go into analytics, the computer and the machine is going to beat you 100 times out of 100 in terms of speed and capability and reach and so on. But the way you think that thing through is the key. Now, artificial intelligence, how many people feel artificial intelligence is really important? OK, I'm going to now scare you. The question I'm going to ask is, to AI or not to AI? Because short-term AI is brilliant. Long-term, AI is extremely dangerous. Do you think that Facebook and Amazon and people like that are good stewards of our future and our data? Absolutely not. If you look at content, and if you look at our, the way our data is, is being utilized or manipulated, it, it is actually being weaponized. And if you put data and analytics together, you have a weapon. And that weapon is artificial intelligence like nuclear, nuclear weapons. And I'll quickly go through that. Uh, so Stephen Hawking said, it's one of the greatest inventions in the world, but it may be the last. Because just like nuclear fission and nuclear, uh, you know, nuclear technology, data technology is just as powerful. Uh, Elon Musk thinks exactly the same thing. Uh, she, this is just an amazing picture, so I always have her. <laughs> uh, how to look into the future with smart glasses. So let me just go into, uh, into this a little bit more. I think that AI can solve some of the big challenges of the world, whether it's poverty, whether it's uh, uh, healthcare and, and stuff like that. So those are the good things about AI. But what are not the, uh, the, the such good things about AI are, how many people think that uh, AI is as, dif as uh, dangerous as nuclear weapons? Anybody? A few people. Why do you think it's as dangerous as nuclear weapons, sir? Actually, when you need to create the AI, you should do something that lets you to do it. So you got to, uh, yeah. I think you know the emergence, right? OK. So sometimes you don't know what it is doing. You don't know what the, the programming is yeah. doing, the process is doing. So yeah. probably it will went to the direction that we don't want. OK, so uh, in the, thank you, sir. In the 1920s and 30s, when nuclear fission was being created, and they were trying to split the atom, what do you think these people were trying to do? They were not trying to create a bomb. They were trying to improve the world. What they were trying to do is to create unlimited energy. What they were trying to do is to have, if we have unlimited energy, then we have uh, so, you know, much more facilities, and we'll have abundance, and we'll have uh, a good future. And guess what? We had a financial crisis, then we had a war, and then they had to go and blow up 500, 600,000 people. Before they realized, they said, oh my god, I think this thing can start killing people, so they started controlling it. Do we control our data? Do we, we don't have a GDPR came in. It's Mickey Mouse compared to what you really need, uh, need as far as the future is concerned. And how you can weaponize it. And I'll just quickly demonstrate that, and then we'll uh, start going into our uh, main session for today. This chart is really important for everybody in this room because 20th century companies are exponentially collapsing. And 21st century companies are exponentially growing. So companies that were born in the 20th century are destined to die in the 21st century, 80, at least 80% of them, because they have 20th century thinking. 
which is managing risk, which is controlling stuff, which is uh, looking at the, the, the type of people that you hire and how, how you engage with them. While the 21st century uh, companies are managing risk and engaging with risk and different kinds of liquid uh, uh, movement of people and, and, and stuff. So we are going through what I call the, the transformation decade. The next 10, 12 years is what's going to defi define our future. We will have more change in the next 10 years than we had in the previous 100. Literally, mark my words. More change in the next 10 years than we had in the previous 100. And, and I think that is the kind of thing. So when we look at something like retail, which affects us on a daily basis, then I think we need to, uh, we need to really, really think about how, these, how do we get onto that curve. And I think today is about how to get onto the future curve, working through this transition decade, and then, then take it in, taking it on from there. OK, so a couple of more slides and a little video to get you excited. And then, off, and then we'll invite our first, uh, first guest, Nilesh. Uh, data bias is happening. Do you know that uh, in Australia, Facebook users were targeting 12, 13, 14-year-old kids about, this is about 12 months ago, 15 months ago, who were going through depression, who were unsettled. So they were writing sad, unhappy, depressed on their status. So the data structure was actually targeting that and selling products because these young kids are much, much more vulnerable to buy. Same thing is happening with ethnic minorities. Same thing is happening with geographical areas in the US. And a lot of companies are now uh, looking at that. The reason I use data bias is that we give the bias into the, into the technology that we have. That is why our ethics and values and morals, all of those things become important, because we are the ones who are inputting it. So we can weaponize it, and then obviously it's going to affect jobs. Longer term, we need to be looking at finding a way to regulate this data. Um, and, and when we get in from our AI, which is today, to artificial general intelligence, which is when they start getting human uh, uh, attributes, is the next level in the next five to 10 years. And the next level after that is artificial superintelligence, which is when they decide to make their own decisions. That's the robots. The reason I'm calling this an, an existential threat is that for the first time in history, well, human beings are the leaders of the world, not because we are the fastest, the biggest, or the strongest. It's because we are the smartest. For the very first time in the history of humanity, we are producing something that is likely to become smarter than us. And then will we survive? And I think that is a very sobering question that we need to ask ourselves, is if we're creating a machine that's a 50,000 times more powerful in its brain processing than ours, then will we survive? Will they let us survive? Will they create a new language that we don't understand, which has started happening very, very early stages? Will they create new methodologies that we, we will not be able to cope with, and so on and so forth? So, I think it's, it's a very, very real threat. Everything is being disrupted, as we know. Uh, you will enjoy this one. How many people know uh, uh, this one? Star Trek? Tricorders. I mean, Dr. McCoy had uh, his little tricorder, and it could get your, uh, all, all your sort of uh, diagnosis and stuff like that. Uh, now, uh, last year, for the very first time, a tricorder has been created so we can actually do this. Uh, it's better than 16 doctors. And uh, in about two years' time, it's going to be as an app. So the hypochondriacs in this room are really going to suffer uh, because you'll know exactly what's going to happen because the sensors and the stuff that they are creating is before you walk into the shower, just imagine, you know, you're walking into the shower, you throw your clothes off, and then all the sensors start working. And, and then it's connected to your your smoothie making machine in your kitchen, well, the, the vitamin D is low and we need more potassium and whatever, and by the time you come out, your juice is ready and you have it, because based upon what is happening to you that day. That's the sort of thing that's going to happen, which is what is going to happen in retail, by the way, is that how the, the sensors are working and our humanity connects. How many people know CRISPR? 
just a couple. CRISPR is this one gene which if you inject it, you get muscles, really, really cool muscles. Okay, so <laughs> uh, here's this little dog, and this little dog has a twin brother. So genetically the same, same parents, everything is exactly the same, okay? And that twin brother was given a, a CRISPR gene. Guess what happened? You wanna see? This is what happened. And while this was happening, some of our Chinese friends discovered this. He said, oh my God, we could, we could use this. They started testing it on embryos. And then as they were for, uh, you know, challenged, they said, oh no, 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 no. Actually, we're not testing it on embryos, we're testing it on chimpanzees. But the jury is still out where they are testing. This is where ethics count. This is where our moral values and compass starts coming in. Technology is going like crazy. Because you can create super races, you can create blue babies, you can have glowing children, literally glowing children, and things like that. You can put chips in your brain and, 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 and so on. Let me just quickly go through because um, we are short on time. Um, so how many people are parents in this room? A lot of us. Parents will have to have look at their kids and then say, as we are growing in this world, and if everything is being automated, what will happen to serendipity, chance, mistakes, and playfulness? This is what we need to get back to. So when we look at a retail environment, if we don't have all of these things, we are becoming less and less human. So there are some things we shouldn't uh, automate, and these are these kinds of things, trust and ethics and relevance and relationships and so on. So as we are building our retail empires, please try not to automate these things because they are actually going to start affecting us as humans. So a little bit of fear, a little bit of hope, right? So what we're gonna do, I'm gonna show you a, a one minute video which is hysterical and then we'll go down to Nilesh who's uh, kindly waiting for us. Uh, this is this old lady, this is, she's a grandmother, and she's been, uh, she's, uh, she's been requested, she's sitting in a car, in a Tesla car, a self-driving automated car. Anyway, so she was put inside the car, and she said, the only thing you're not allowed to do is to hold the steering or to use the brake. But you sit there, and the instructor is right next door to her. Just see what happens to her, and visualize yourself in that, but in two ways. One is as a, in a, within a car, and the other is in terms of your life. And here we go. Oh, oh, there's cars! Oh, there's cars! just put me back for me controlling. Oh dear Jesus! I could never. Ah, ah! Oh, where's it going? God damn, Bill! Oh my God! Oh, this is so scary. My, oh Jesus! This is my first day out, and I'm, I'm about to die. Oh come on, relax. Oh my God, Bill! I I couldn't do it. Oh oh, is the car coming? Just oh my God! They're gonna hit us! Oh I it's ah! Okay, hit the brakes! Hit the oh, brakes! Oh my right. Jesus! Now you're driving. Can you recognize this? The only thing that was happening was that she was not allowed to touch the steering wheel. So what was happening? She lost control. What is happening in our lives? We're losing control. And that is where we are going, ladies and gentlemen, is we're losing control, but we are not ready to make that shift and that transition. So I think the way we need to look at ourselves is become more human, become more relevant, and have more ethics and values as we go forward, because that is going to really help to define our future. I hope uh, you enjoyed that. Now we've got these amazing speakers to follow. And, and the first one is, is Nilesh from uh, Sheriff DG. I mean, Sheriff DG is, is a household brand name. It's, a, it's genuinely a super brand. And we just drive past and, uh, and always we, we see it there. But also we all have uh, stories and experiences. And I use the word experiences with uh, uh, with Sheriff DG, and, and I'll share one of mine, and, uh, and congratulations to Nilesh. Uh, I had one of these uh, uh, Lenovo laptops which had the SSD inside it, and it crashed, and all my data was there. And I went to Sheriff DG, and the guy was like a doctor. <laughs> Don't worry, sir, 
His name was something, very strange name. His name was something, I think it was Lovely. No, Lovely? Yeah, it was a very, very strange name. It was like a very kind name. And it was, he was called that. He actually sat there and leave it with me. And it took him about 24 to 48 hours. And he got all my data back, threw the computer away, sold me two computers. I didn't care. <laughs> I, I bought everything. But I got all my data back. And, and I think I remember that experience. And experiences are what you remember. I have no reason to go anywhere else. And that, to me, is what the future of retail is about, how I connect with my human side. Over to you, sir, please. Thank you, Zahid. Thank you. Okay. Good morning. Yeah. Good. Uh, it's a bit of a challenge, yeah, but uh, let me again continue the story which uh, was told by Tariq's video, right? Customer experience is very important. We all think that we are inventing the best of technology and best of things, but just you saw how the consumer reacts. Why? Because when we are inventing, we have not exposed the customer to our technologies which are getting developed. We feel that we know everything. We feel that what we are developing in the lab is perfect, and it will have high, expect high, ex uh, high acceptance, and my business will scale up. Unfortunately, it does not happen, right? OK, so let me start with the, with the theme. What you see here is retail as a service, right? Uh, let me tell you a story about my journey, OK? How I never knew any retail, actually, when I started Sharaf DG in 2004, right? After engineering, I was a scientist. I was testing missiles, right, back in India in, in the defense research. But my story has been whenever I get bored, I change jobs. I said, let me do something new, right? That, that has been, been my journey as an adventure. So after that, I said, what do I do? So I said, OK, let, let me do some MBA. So I did my MBA, right? After MBA, the scientist doing an MBA, how do you, how do you, where do you employ him? He's a nerd. What, what do you do with him? He says, OK. HP saw something in me. They said, look, we, we sell high-end HP 9000 Unix machines uh, during, during those times. I said, why don't you try to sell this to the scientific community? I said, OK, fine. So they hired me as a consultant. So I started selling uh, you know, HP high-end machines to the research community. Did that for a while. Again, got bored. Telecom was opening up. So I jumped into a telecom industry. They sent me to the remotest parts of India, started launching telecom, had fun. Okay, had adventures, got chased, right? Did that, established telecom, again got bored, right? BPO industry was opening up, went to BPO industry, right? And then, of course, I had to settle, got married, came here. And then the investors in the Sharaf family were looking for somebody. Uh, so I said, why do you hire me? I don't know retail. I said, we exactly want to hire you because we something in you because you have survived so many industries, right? And you have stories to tell and you have success to to, to replicate in different types of energy. So you're not afraid of the unknown, right? And so they hired me, right? So I'm the third employee. We had a project director and a secretary. We, I started writing processes. Then I started recruiting. How do I recruit? I don't know retail. What do I do? So I, I traveled to all the countries. I, I traveled to Syria. I traveled to Jordan. I traveled to India. So what I used to do is I used to land up, right? Take a cab. I said, OK, take me to the electronic stores in the, in the, in the city. So I sit in the cab, hotel car, and then go, walk into the store as a consumer, meet, meet the employees or the salespeople. The salespeople whom I liked, I used to give my visiting card. I said, come in the evening for a cup of coffee, right? I used to come in the hotel. And that's how I recruited my first team of, of close to around 40 people, right? So we started, right? At that point of time when we were starting, so we, we call ourselves a 13-year-old startup. Right? Our challenge was we had established players in the, in the, in the city. Right? You had Carrefour, you had Lulu, you had specialty, specialty stores like plugins and all, all the rods. And we, we, we were just rookies. Right? We, we were just starting. Nobody knew. Who are you? Sharaf, OK, who are you? Right? So we said, OK, we need to do something different. Right? Now, investors had given me a mandate. They said, we need big stores. I said, why do you need big stores? No, no, we have seen Best Buy. We have seen Media Mart. We need big stores. These stores are not here. You do it. I said, OK. So we have, I have to build big stores. Fine, OK. But building big stores, 
contains a lot of risk. Because the bigger your store is, the more inventory you need to buy to fill it in. Now, what do I do, right? So I said, oh my God, we have got a problem, right? So I need to solve this challenge, right? Because my risk is, is, is it will be maybe, maybe, maybe two times or three times my competition because my stores will be two to three times bigger. And he says, no, no, we'll have to launch the biggest store because that's, that's, that's the DNA of Dubai, right? They always want to do the biggest, tallest, and everything has to be big, right? So, but you have to manage that, uh, that, that, that uh, superlatives, right? So he says, okay, fine. So we said, fine, let's start. So at that point of time, we said, okay, what is the risk? The risk is the inventory. How do you do it? I said, okay, let's do a just-in-time model, what Toyota does, right? So instead of a factory, you, you imagine it's a store, and goods have to just come in and go out as consumers buy. So in 2005, we built systems and we connected close to around 400 of our suppliers, right? And they used to get the data, they used to get the replenishment, how much they have to replenish, which store, and then, and then it, 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 the journey started. Yes, it was broken at first, but we perfected it, and that's how it, it, it continued. Today, okay, we operate in Oman, Bahrain, Qatar, we just exited, okay, Egypt, and we will enter now Saudi. Today, here we have 40% market share, right? Because we started with one store in Ibn Battuta. Monthly, we have we cater to close to around 1 million customers. There is other side of Sharaf DG, which is, which is the B2B arm, which caters to 60,000 SMBs. Now, we, we are the technology fulfillment partners, and we work with Etislad. So 60,000 SMBs, when they need technology, they come to us, right? And we have been servicing them for the last four years. Soon we will launch something which we'll call as device as a service. Started startup community like you, why should you, you know, burn capex to buy, let's say, a phone or a screen or a laptop or a, or a desktop or a data center, right? Give us the subscription and it'll it'll come to you, right? Keep paying the subscription. Your service is on. You don't want it. No strings attached. Thank you very much, right? So this is the st step. The next step what we are taking. We are trying with the SMEs now because we have got a huge base, and then hopefully a day will come where these things we'll experiment with on the consumer side also. Why should we? It's a, it's a gig economy, right? It's a sharing economy. Why should we own something, right? Why don't we share or why don't we just, you know, change, right? Okay, and and, and pay as you go. So so this is where we want to go. Yes, we are a member of Euronix. Euronix is the fourth largest electronics buying organization. We are a consortium, and we are present in 29 countries. It's a 25 years old organization. The collective buying power of this organization is close to around 21 billion euros, right? So why we are there? Yes, we get a platform. We share a lot of knowledge how to do retail. We understand how retail is getting disrupted and how we need to move forward. Now here, today my theme is to talk about two initiatives which we run and which, which which we started around two years back, and we do it with the startup community. The first is called DG Spring. Now, DG Spring is an initiative where we work with startups, and we try to co-create their technology, right? It can be a technology which can be used inside retail or for SMBs, or if you have a product, then it moves into a concept called Solution Bar. I'll, I'll, I'll discuss in detail of what Solution Bar means. How we work, we co-create and implement for Sharaf DG, and we have, we'll show you case studies of what we have done. So basically, we open our infrastructure in terms of customers, in terms of our physical stores, in terms of our technology, in terms of our processes, and then see how the startup technology can be customized, can be fine-tuned, can, can be refined, and then finally, can be commercialized, okay? We did POC with select six startups out of 112. Two we selected. One is Mintem. Mintem is an AI-based technology where which, which we have deployed inside our stores, where basically when people touch the screen, so there'll be a screen beside a product, and when people are browsing through the screen, they, they, it, it, it gives the analytics, and it tries to predict what the consumer's intention was and what the consumer was trying to do. The second thing is, is Shopper 360, which is video analytics. Basically, what I feel is a lot of innovations have happened online, right? But physical retail is still a black box. The moment the consumer walks in and I ring a sale at my point of sale, right, 
What happens between that journey? Nobody knows. Okay. There's still room to bring in a lot of technologies and a lot of innovations inside the physical retail. Online, you can know every click. You have a lot of analytics. You can deploy a lot of technologies, whether it's an AI or whatever you want, right? But in a physical space, we are still struggling. There have been a lot of technologies which have been developed, but unfortunately, nothing has matured, right? So we had beacons, we had a lot of Wi-Fi, you had a lot of stuff where we try to understand what happens inside a physical retail. And that makes physical retail to run all the more difficult. Because I don't know what is happening. I just know the sales. I just know the footfalls which came inside the store. So we said, look, yes, I know how many people came inside my store. I know what I'm selling. But I don't know what, what they came for. And, 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 and I don't know where they went inside my store. So we worked with a startup from India called Shopper360, who utilizes our video cameras and then tells me how many people are going in which department, right? And it tries to predict based on how long the shopper stays in, in the particular department about his intention to buy, how serious he is. So if the customer stays in the department for five minutes and more, he becomes a serious shopper. So it starts predicting that, look, in, from this department, you should have generated whatever, 10 invoices or 15 invoices today. It checks against my actuals and see where, where we are there or not there, OK? So these type of technologies, we have, we have actually gone live, and, 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 and we are trying to perfect it further and see how we can collect more intelligence from inside the physical space. Well, let's come back to retail. After all this story, for the last 23 years since web was invented, world over, only 10% of retail happens online. 90% of the re retail is still happening in brick and mortars. Yes, we can hear doomsday. We can see a lot of you know, collapses happening. But still, physical retail is still contributing 90% of the retail, right? Now, we have to take a bet. Should we be in physical retail or not? Yes, we should be, because I strongly believe, as I said earlier, that there is a lot of innovation still to be done. We need a lot of technologies to go inside the physical retail, because that's the black box, right? And it is more difficult to run physical retail because there is a lot of involvement of human beings there. Because when consumer walks in, they expect to interact with a human being. And unfortunately, we human beings have intelligence. Unfortunately, we are not machines, right? Whereas when you're running a perfect online, you build an algorithm, it will exactly work what you have designed for. But when you try to do this to a human, let's say your sales executive or your staff inside the store, you can't program them. Impossible. They have source of motivations which can be you know, unknown, right? They are unhappy today. Their mood is bad, right? And, and that's the challenge of how do you get the salespeople or how do you get your staff inside your store to give the best of experience to your consumers. And mind you, we are the only industry where we have to deliver all this without knowing whether I'll get paid for it or not, right? We are the only industry. Imagine an airline industry. You get the best services provided you first buy a ticket. In retail, you don't buy a ticket. You walk in, right? You expect the best of the services. And you want the best of smiles. You want people to be excellent. You want, I don't know, superhuman, right? Now, the law of economics we are trying to solve, how do we make it work, right? The consumer is not paying. He wants the excellent servers. I don't know whether I'll get paid for not. Maybe I'll have to put some algorithm to do a probability, right? OK, we are working on it. We need a technology, right? How do I finance that human, superhuman to be inside the store to give the best of the experience when I don't know when people who are walking inside my store will be paying for it or not, OK? On the other hand, we have an 800-pound gorilla, Amazon, right, running a valuation game. He makes losses. But his valuation goes up. He does not allow us to make money while we sell products. So, so as I said, we are a startup. So what we are now right now working, and we'll go into the next chapter as, as retail as a service is, so we decided, look, guys, we are reaching a stage where we will not make money selling products. So what do we do? We have stores. We have people. What do we do? How, how do we make money? I said, I said, we need to think, right? We need to understand why the consumer comes inside our store. Because we are not going to make money by selling products. We are not going to make money on the iPhone, right? Because the online guys are not, because they are doing the GMV game, the transaction game. They will not allow us to make money. 
So we need to do something else. So we said, okay, what has happened to the world? Internet became a media, right? Internet started as a media. Then Google came in. They started organize, organizing all the information inside the internet, right? Based on that information, the media caught on. Today, 80%, 90% of the searches happen on, 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 on internet, so which is the media. Excellent. Well done. Then, come the, then comes the e-commerce, right? So Amazon came in, right? So the media started selling. So media has taken our role, right? Internet was supposed to be a media. Then it started selling. So it became retail. So what do I do, right? So I can't sell, right? So if I don't sell, I have to search for something else. So I have to disrupt myself. So we said, OK, let's start disrupting ourselves. My investors told, are you crazy? You still make money. You want to disrupt? I said, yeah, if I don't, I don't disrupt myself today, tomorrow, let's say, rest in peace, right? So we said, OK. So we started with a concept called retail as a service. So we said, when we said retail as a service, established brands said, nothing doing. Are you crazy? Why should I pay you for your service? Right? You, we, we give you a product. We make beautiful products. You earn by selling them. So we said, OK. They are not the segment for experimentation. Let's talk to the startups. Now, what does the startups do? If you see this slide, you have an idea. You recruit people. You raise money. Right? You build a beautiful products, then you manufacture, right? And then you, 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 you want people to buy, right? One crucial step, what you are missing before you convert that prototype or before you convert your first batch into, 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 your, into your big manufacturing, whatever, the numbers, right? That step what is missing is, is, is you have not done your interaction with physical retail. We saw, again, I'll come back to that video of grandma in Tesla, right? Imagine if you have built Tesla, and that is how humans will start reacting when you scale up, your Model 3 comes out. Unfortunately, it is not, but just giving an exaggerated example, what will happen? It will be failure. You should have said, oh my god, I should have interacted with physical customers and tested my product, and then gone for, for being, giving a big manufacturing order, right? So we said, yes, there is a need for makers. So we started connecting with makers all over the world and started exploring this idea. And we clearly found out is today, demand generation to now a media. Stores are the media for, a, for, for the brand today. Why? Because as I said earlier, 90% of retail still happens in physical space. Why? Because we have got a human need to use all our five senses at, before you buy. You cannot use all your five senses when you are on a two-dimensional screen, right? You need to go into a physical space, right? So these are the dimensions which we have mentioned. And you see these stars, right? Discovery, physical is better than online. So I'm just comparing physical and online. Display and engage, physical is again better than online because you touch and feel the product. Demo and expert, if it's a software, yes, two-dimension screen is more than enough. But if it's a product where you touch, and feel and smell, if, when you, even if you have to taste something where the product is producing something, it has to be the physical space, right? Buy, get, and use. Online does an excellent job. Brick and mortar is catching up. Repair and return, still brick and mortars do a better job, as, as Tariq was explaining, right? When you go into, you see somebody, somebody tries to help you, OK? Discovery, OK? So that's how we started our journey of retail as a service, and we named it Solution Bar. Now, this is the Times Square store, right, where you see a table on, near the Samsung sign. We have, we have kept the table there, uh, where we have all these products from startups and makers from all over the world coming there, right? And this is the journey of our, of our retail as a service, where what we do is we showcase a product. That means what we are saying is, when you manufacture and when you scale up and when you enter the retail store, don't become just a product on the shelf because your products won't fly. Because you need customers who are early adopters. You need customers who are willing to experiment a new idea or a new technology. So it has to be showcased. Now, take an example of this bulb, right? Now, this is, this is an IoT, right? It's a bulb which you can control through an app, OK, right? Simple thing. But if you just keep it as, as a packet inside the shelf, it will get lost. 
Somebody has to demonstrate, somebody has to show how good is the user experience of the app which is connecting with the, with the, with the bulb. Some, what are your features, or how you are different, what is, for what did you get your patent for? It has to be explained, right? If it does not get explained, you get lost inside the shelf space when you enter retail directly after, after launching your final version. You need a demo, you need an expert, right? You need your product USP to be explained by a trained staff. You need this staff to collect feedback from customers and route it back to you so that you clearly understand how that customer experience, that feedback is coming to you, and if there is a need to refine your product, if there is a need to improve your product, right? Marketing, we open all our marketing assets to the startups, right? We have close to around 1.8 million database of customers. We have close to around 1.3 million fans in the Facebook, right? We have marketing automations, like people who come to the store, we, 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 we send them emails to retarget them. We sell them links to, to collect the NPS score to understand how well the engagement was and on how well the, the product is doing. And we run a lot of analytics, which we give back to the maker to understand what is happening, right from demos to right from consumer feedbacks to right from from, from any, any, any other product improvement needs to be done. We have a lot of reports about sales, inventory, impressions, engagement, right? How many people came in? What did they say? Interaction and audience info, what profile? You can do the analytics. And Dubai is the right place to bring your products into the retail store because, as you know, Dubai is multicultural. You have more than, God knows, we, we keep, keep claiming 150, 200, or whatever nationalities who, who stay here, right? Okay, so it's, 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 it's a good, and that is why globally products or, or, or the makers are getting interested to test market their products in Dubai because we, we are able to give them the feedback from audience or from consumers of different nationalities, right? Which they will never get it in other parts of the world. Word of mouth, people buy and people have bought, right? And then when we spread word of mouth and we publish these images in our social media, there is a lot of trust of the brand of Sharaf DG, which gets rubbed on to the product. Because if Sharaf DG is recommending and Sharaf DG is doing something, right, it, 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 it's re, it is really good. Okay. Okay. Because we are known for trust, and that is how we have established ourselves. And, and that trust gets rubbed off to your product or to your idea, which gets showcased inside the store. So in a nutshell, okay, what do we do? We support the brand for localization. We send impressions, engagement, and feedback data to the maker. We provide sales executives from Sharaf DG family who would be trained to demo the USP of your product. We, we do the marketing in online and offline media reaching over three million customers. And we transfer the entire sales proceeds to you with zero margin. There has been a lot of pressure from my team to say, no, no, the makers are asking, you know, why don't you keep your margins? I said, no, we'll not do sales. Why? Because we are providing this service. We provided a space, we provided a trained staff, we are providing analytics, we are providing. So this is a service. So we will charge a fixed amount for that service. We will, no matter how many millions the product sells, we will not keep the sales proceeds. The sale proceeds will go down, go back to the, to the maker. We just charge for that service, right? And that is how the model. So the, basically, we are saying now as a retailer, we are now becoming a media. So that's the disruption, that's the transformation. Media has become retail, now retail is becoming the media. Okay? And we'll charge for your service, right? Because we, we keep asking the makers, guys, look, you pay Google tons of money, right? Correct? Do you have a, a, a perfect correlation of how much money you spend and how much sales are happening? No, right? You take a print ad in a, in a, in a Gulf News, let's say, right? So when you take a print ad, you don't hold Gulf News responsible of how many units got sold, right? You, you, you do the ad because it has a credibility. Let's go back to the case study. So this is basically a, a company, startup company from India called Square Off, okay? And uh, when, when they registered on Kickstarter, it got pre-order of 2,000 units, right? Kickstarter worked with us. We put it in one store, right? We got 660 customers interested to buy in 60 days. Okay, why? Okay, because we sent 500,000 emails. 60,000 Facebook live views were there. 50,000 impressions were there, 1.3 million Facebook reach, and 900 radio spots. So we have a digital radio which runs inside our stores, right? So we, we gave them the spots. There were more than 5,000 interactions from consumers, and consumer rated it 4.3 out of 5. 
now 200 and plus feedback on product user experience. App features, it used to crash earlier, so consumers used it, gave the feedback to the maker that look, it is crashing, and here, so they fixed their software, right, and, and pushed the new version, and they improved their, 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 their product, right? Next. ActoFit, ActoFit is basically a fitness scale, right? 110 units sold in 90 days, sold three times the incumbent, the other incumbent, a regular brand which was, which was there inside the store. Why? Because we could demo and we could explain it to the consumer, right? Versus that product of a much more known brand sitting, sitting on the shelf where nobody was explaining about the features and benefits and the highlights about the product, right? So same story, right? We send emails and all our marketing stuff, right? 400,000, 400 plus feedback. We restocked it three times. That means they send us the inventory three times. It was selling so fast, right? And then the brand was introduced in the, in, 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 uh, introduced another product. So now they have given us another of their products from their portfolio to be, to, be, to be displayed in the solution bar. So that's my story. Let's make it work. We are open. My colleague Anand is here. I've, I've given the, uh, his, 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 his timetable. So he is, he is a part of, of DG Spring and, 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 and Solution Bar. And, and, and we want to work together with you guys. All of you are welcome. Wishing you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nilesh. Thanks very much. I've, uh, you, you should stay here. Uh, congratulations to him. Because I'll tell you my custom experience. The guy's name was Noble Baby. Yeah? yeah? I mean, what kind of a name is that? So you can never forget that. I forgot. So I actually saw his emails coming through. His name is Noble Baby. And Noble Baby looked after all my data. So thank you very much for the experience. Appreciate it. <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, so that was a, an interesting journey into a, a really a very successful case study uh, that is there in our midst. And as we will go into the panel, we'll see how Sheriff DG is going to project itself into the future and how we will be immersing ourselves into that kind of uh, retail environment. Uh, now we've got uh, uh, Rod Nakuzi, who is from Transcorp, and he's going to talk about his transformational journey. So uh, as transformation and uh, his entrepreneurial journey. Please, Rod, uh, over to you, sir. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Tarek, for facilitating this session. Thank you, DTEC, for organizing this uh, lovely morning gathering. My name is uh, Rodrigo Nakuzi. I'm the CEO and founder of Transcorp International. Transcorp International, it is a last mile delivery company specialized in temperature controlled deliveries. Why Transcorp? Why last mile? Why temperature controlled? Well, as soon as I landed in the UAE 11 back, uh, I always had a dream to start my own company. I had few ideas, but it was never about the idea, it, it's, it was always about the product itself and if the market needed the product. So we started Transcorp. Why last mile? It was never a last mile delivery company. It was a B2B company. It was, not, it was never a B2C. But we saw a big gap in the market and we decided to jump on it and we were not scared to change the concept of the company. Why temperature control? Well, in big cities or in big business hubs like the UAE, if you're not a niche and if you are a self-funded company, it would be hard for you to play with the big players. So we decided to take a niche, which is the temperature control. No one back then was, let's say, entertaining it. So we were the only players and it was successful. The big questions that all the entrepreneurs will be reading or will be listening to from the news is why 90% of the companies will be shutting down within the first year. I will be looking at it from a different perspective. Why 1% or let's say 10%, one out of 10 entrepreneurs are succeeding? What are the key factors for their success? And what are the key success for their sustainability? Anyone from the crowd would like to share his experience why the entrepreneurs are failing? Well, I've had the occasion and the experience of failing several startups. So um, one of those is sometimes people are stuck and don't really want to talk about their ID. 
they stay alone, they think they have something very secret and then don't share it, uh, which they should do. Financially, um, incubators, accelerators are helping startups to grow and to like, get visibility and knowledge on how to raise money, how to grow. And sometimes people are just maybe unexperienced and don't have uh, yeah, the right knowledge to... I totally with agree with you. The shared economy is the future. And this is what DTEC is trying to do. So there are three main factors. One of them is the market. Second one is the setup itself. And the third one, the way I see it, is the entrepreneur himself. Let's start with the market factors. Does the market need the product? Regardless if the product is successful or not, does it, the market does have any requirement for your product? If it doesn't, then you should not operate it. You should look for a different market. Is the market size enough to, un to entertain your growth? Is it the right timing to operate? I'm talking about the personal timing and I'm talking about the business timing. In terms of personal, you, do, you don't need to have a big events going on in parallel with your launching because you will be fully drowned in your uh, setup. So make sure all your big events are completed or delayed a bit and make sure you focus on your setup. In terms of market, well, you don't need to launch during Expo 2020, for example, because all the attention will be directed towards those big, big events. You, will not, you don't need to launch during a market recession because people will not be looking at any changes. The competition. Uh, as soon as we started, we were the only player doing temperature control deliveries. We were very happy, and it was a very, let's say, stress-free journey. Two years down the line, competitors started to pop up, and big competitors, and it was very aggressive. We were very stressed about it. We were very, let's say, mad about it, but the more we understood this competition, the better we have executed our business. So what happened is we embraced this competition. We understood it. We tried to, to know where they are failing, and we, we, we achieved, let's say, our objective. We tried to be different. We were always a market disruptors. They were trying to, let's say, to follow what we did, but we were at least one step ahead of them. The setup itself, the product. The market needed a company like Transcope. There was no one there. But let's say you're starting a GPS tracking company, and your maps doesn't work, and your technology is not working. So why are you starting it? You need to make sure the product is successful, you need to do a proof of concept, a successful proof of concept, to make sure that you're, you're launching a right product in the right market. As the gentleman said, and this is a very crucial element, the cash flow. And I'm sure most of you will agree with me on this element because no matter how successful you are, no matter what kind of product you have, without cash flow, I'm talking about self-funded companies, guys, of course. I'm not talking about the well-funded companies. I'm talking about companies who've, who are running on a bootstrapping mode. Whatever they are generating, they are re-injecting it in the companies. So cash flow can be a decisive element in your growth and in your continuity. You can be successful, but without cash flow, you cannot continue. Banks, for the first couple of years, they will be very hesitant to support you, which I totally understand. And it was proven that they have the right to do it. So you need to make sure you, ha you are encountered by the right, let's say, angel friends or the right angel investors, or to run on a very bootstrapping mode. Your team. I was lucky to have a good team. I always believed in young talents for m many reasons. Financial reasons, for it's a startup. You cannot afford big salaries their passion, their dedication, and their courage to join such startups because their responsibilities is much less than, let's say, an established uh, employee. So it is true I have created Transcorp, but the team around me are the one who made it because after a few months, I was out of the operation. I was focusing on the growth of the company, and this is what every entrepreneur should be doing. The first couple of months, you need to have your hands on in the business, but after that, you need to fully focus on how to grow the business. So make sure you focus on the business, not in the business itself. To 
sustain your business, you need to be profitable. Without profitability, you cannot scale up your business. Make sure you are very transparent with your customers. Tell them, yes, we are making profit and we are proud of it because with our profits, you will be able to grow your companies. We will be able to be more flexible, giving you more solutions, giving you more options. So with, um, again, I'm going to repeat, guys, it is for self-funded companies, this strategy, because some companies, they don't care. They care about the volumes. They care about the valuation. But for self-funded startup companies, you need to be profitable. The technology. Once we started, we didn't have any technology. And we know it is a digital era. Without technology, you will be outcompeted. You will be out of the market very soon. So what we tried to develop is a one-kind and one-of-a-kind technology that will eliminate or that will change the current processes in the market. Imagine, guys, courier companies, they have a, they have a pouch to deliver for you. They'll be calling you from a call center based somewhere abroad. They will be asking you about your address. You will tell them, for example, I'm based in Media City. Media City, is it Dubai or Abu Dhabi, they will ask you. Seriously, guys, you don't need those kind of calls. We are in digital world. People should be able to pin locations. People should be able to choose their delivery windows. So what we developed is a technology that changed the whole and disrupt the whole courier industries. No more phone calls. No more waiting time at homes, since we, we are still the only company giving four delivery windows per day. So within three hours, your package will be delivered. You will not be waiting the whole morning or the whole evening, and somebody, they will sh show up or they don't show up. All of that is done through technology. We're pushing information to the customers. It's not the customer who's coming back to us. We're pushing track and trace uh, information. The customer will be able to see his package, and if he's not at home, he can reschedule with a single click. Nobody will be calling them. Nobody will be bothering them. Even if you are in a meeting, you can simply reply by yes or no or reschedule. So the technology was a very crucial element for us, and this is one of the factors that took Transcorp to the next level. But make sure you have a proof of concept, a successful one, because you don't need any technology. You need your right technology. The entrepreneur himself, he's the captain of the ship. He's the leader. He's whom everyone is looking up to him. You should be always optimistic. You should be always supportive. But you should be always realistic. Whatever you draft on papers is different in reality. The numbers that you project, they're lovely, but you need to achieve them. If you don't achieve them, it's not the end of the world. You need to stay always focused on the business. You need to be realistic in what you're doing, and people will follow. Having the right business attitude. I think it's a golden rule for any entrepreneur to be enthusiastic, down to earth. He should put his ego aside. He should be, uh, how to say it, eagle-eyed, and people will come to you and your product will get the right attention. At initial stages, you need your hands on in the business. And this is what I did. I was fully involved in every aspect of the business. But I knew if I don't have the right people to run the business, I will never be able to grow Transcorp. This is why you need to have the right team, and you need to have the right compatibility within the team. You need to raise a culture of loyalty in the company. And how you do that, you share your profits, you share your losses, you share your good moments and your bad moments with those people. It is your second family. Otherwise, you're not going to make it. Throughout your journeys, you're going to be having ups and downs. A lot of downs more than ups. So too much downs, then the ups will come. Since you are the leader, people will be looking at you. So if you are down, negative, you will be able to pass this to your employees, and the employees will be able to pass it on to your customers. And this is a very negative aspect to your business. You need to embrace stress. You need to make stress as a friend and know how to overcome it. And you need to be driven by success and not only by, by money. Money is important, but success is a motivational factor for everyone in the company. You will be making money sooner or later, but you need to look for how to achieve 
the company's success and meet your company objectives. The journey. I see it in four phases. Um, let me describe it. It's the World Cup era. So let's take an example of a young football team full of amateurs playing in a rookie league. This is your first phase. You're very passionate, you're very energetic, you just want to rule the world. You will spend three years there, you jump from the second division, which is the rookie league, to the premier league. Let's take the English premier league, for example. So you, the startup phase is done, now you are in the major league, you're playing with the giants. To be able to do it, you need more talents on board. You need more ex expertise on board. You need more technology on board. Without funds, you're not be, gonna be able to do it. So this is what we did. We raised funds recently to grow the business and take it to different cities. We are able to grow it organically, but it will take us a lot of time. So if you are to raise funds, it should be, be this is my advice, based on a story, or based on decent numbers. You don't raise funds the first zero to two years unless your numbers are justified. Make sure you have a high EBITDA or a high gross or net profit because investors, whatever ideas you're gonna give them, they're gonna be looking at your numbers. So if you don't want the numbers to be the decisive factor in your fundraising, make sure you bring investors on board before you start based on a concept, based on an idea. So you played in the major league, you won the league, now you went to the Champions League. You want to go regional, from Dubai to the Gulf. You need more talents, more technology, more energy in the company, and more funds. Some companies decide to stay in, like locally, they don't want to go regionally, which is not wrong. Maybe they've seen that there is no room for their product in different countries, but for us, we still believe that there are a lot of rooms locally and regionally. And our plan is to go internationally, not only regionally. Because we're gonna be always focused on what we do. We're not gonna be any courier company. We're just gonna be touching the FMB sector, the cosmetics and pharmaceuticals, and anything that needs temperature control deliveries. To wrap it up with few advices, never be a follower. Never copy paste a, a setup or a competitor. Make sure you are a market disruptor because this is how you're gonna get all the attention in the market. This is how investors will come to you. They're gonna know you're changing things. You're not just like any other entrepreneur in the market. I said it before, work on the business, not in the business, but this should happen after a few, let's say, few months. At initial stages, make sure your hands are on. Don't enter into price wars because you are not equipped at initial stages to fight those sharks. Make sure you are always customer service driven, customers will appreciate it and they will stick around. We had an incident. We had competitions coming to our customers, giving them 50% less than Transcope. Ask me how many customers we lost out of 150. One. This is the customer loyalty that we have, one. And that customer tried, ironically, to come back at us after one week. Unfortunately, we have filled up the spot by someone else by then. Run a revenue generated and always be a low profile, let's say, setup. Don't get the attention of the big players because if they feel that you are grabbing a market share from them, they will just make sure to fight you. They will make sure to close your business or they will make sure to acquire you. That's not a bad thing, but if you have a vision for the company, Getting acquired at early st stages is, I see it is, is, is like the end of your uh, success. Be flexible and ready for adjustments. This is what we did. We were a B2B business model. We have completely shifted our model to become a B2C business model. We were not afraid of it. We were very hesitant, but very assured about the results we're gonna get from such shift. Your business plan, is great, but I'll be honest with you guys, and frankly speaking, you will, you will change your business plan 10 times throughout the journey. Be an entrepreneur and not a businessman. Don't look at your business from a perspective one plus one equal two. Make sure with one plus one you make it 10. How? Find a way to do it.
There is always a way. If there is a will, there is always a way. Avoid transactional business. The cost of acquiring a new business should be calculated. If your cost of acquiring a new business is low, fine, go for transactional business. But if, if it's costing you a lot of money and a lot of time, avoid it. Avoid it. My new project. Since I believe in startup, and we're still a startup, no matter what our size is, we have the startup mentality. My aim is to promote the new entrepreneurs and bring them to a different league. We are here as a company because of entrepreneurs like you. We believed in their concept, we helped them to grow, and they help us in return to grow. So this eco-friendly and supportive environment that we have is what made Transcorp successful. So the new project will be also based on such things. It is called Gourmet Hub. Gourmet Hub will be a hub for young millennials, food entrepreneurs. Now if you want to open a food concept, you look at your operating cost, trade licensing, hiring, visa cost, you will see, like, I don't have money. Why I'm, how am I going to do it? This is an option for you how to do it. So it is divided into two main sectors, one for startups and one for medium companies. For startup, it's to, uh, to avoid the aggregate operating cost, so you can operate on a monthly minimum royalty fees. And for medium-sized companies, to promote or to sell their products regionally while they're still here. How is that? Because we'll be opening 10 different hubs in 10 different cities. Imagine you are a food entrepreneur in Dubai. You have a very successful model. Overnight, your products are in 10 different cities. How is that? Because we have a, a team of, let's say, experts. We're going to get the recipes. We're going to get the know-how, the packaging, the supplying of all your products. And we're going to do the same setup in every city. So overnight, you are selling your products in those cities and you're increasing your numbers. How are we going to do it? It's not only the hub because it's going to be an online incubator as well. We will be pushing and promoting your business. We will never hold an inventory ourselves. We're just going to act as an aggregator. So we're going to be having shared kitchens. This is for startups. We're going to be having private studios. This is for medium-sized companies. We will be having retail zones to sell your products on the spot within the hub. So we're going to be having working work customers, co-working spaces, and event section. I'm sorry, DTEC, but it's, we're not competing. It's completely different. And an online incubator. And this is the most important aspect. If, like, I'm sure you're going to be having your own e-commerce. But imagine we're going to be having our own e-commerce as well to push your products. So we're going to be have a very focused marketing towards the foodies in town. And of course, who's going to be doing the deliveries? It's Transcorp. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, I will be happy to take any of your questions if you have any. Thank you. The next one is Thibaut. Thibaut is with Albatross, and uh, he's going to be talking about how technology can kill or boost a retail business. Uh, and we had a little sidebar uh, a couple of minutes ago, and we were talking about this, and he said, you know, he agreed with me to some extent that actually the future is not about technology, and the future is about humanity. And he's going to share his experiences with us in terms of how that happens. Uh, Thibault, over to you, sir. OK, good, uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Um, I'm Thibault. I'm working for a customer experience agency called Albatros CX. And a couple of, uh, of weeks ago, I was asked to work on these two, uh, two, uh, two questions. How the, the customer experience changing with the fast pace of technology and the adaptation retailer need to take to make it up. So I was in a flight between Dubai and Shanghai. And I was working on it, OK? And during uh, an hour and a half, I was writing some bullet points and so on. And I realized, landing in, uh, in, um, in Shanghai, that uh, I needed three hours to deliver this speech. 
And I said to myself, either I deliver in 20 minutes something that has to be said in three hours, but with my terrible French accent, nobody will get it, or I skip everything and I go directly to what people are asking to a, a consultant, industry knowledge and methodology. Okay, for the next 19 minutes, I will share knowledge about how technology sometimes kill the business and sometimes boost the business. And together, we will review our uh, recommendation in terms of methodology to implement met uh, technology boosting the business. So, working on worst and best practices and the methodology for success. So let's start with the worst, uh, worst practices, okay? So one day, an Italian uh, CEO of a fashion brand woke up in the morning and say, I would like all my staff to be equipped with the best CRM client telling app that you can find in the world available before Chinese New Year. We were at the end of September. Chinese New Year at uh, that year was the end of January. Okay, so to develop an app for a worldwide brand and to be available in a few months, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a big challenge, okay? And basically, uh, what he did to make it all the same other equip the deadline, he closed the restaurant of the company where the, the staff had their lunch to put 50 developers. He had the best... Um, uh, photograph to shoot all his collection. Everything was ready at the end of December. Mid-January, all the set advisor in greater China of this brand had the iPhone 6, was the latest at that time, in their pocket with their app working perfectly well. Perfectly well. The best app you can find. And guess what? Their sales drop big time. Big time. Okay, and I had a, a lunch with this, uh, with this team who were very enthusiastic about this launch and it's working very well and it's easy to use and uh, they have an amazing features, but the sales drop. So do you have any idea why a brilliant technology actually had a negative impact on the turnover on the business of this company? The answer is extremely simple. This amazing technology was not needed by this brand. As simple as that. At that time, the Italian brand was very famous. The traffic was good. The collection was amazing. And basically, what the server had in their pocket, it's an app to deal with the existing client, a CRM app, okay? And you can imagine the CEO deciding that making hundreds of thousands of euros to make it live and so on. So you can imagine retail area manager and so on, putting a lot of pressure uh, to use it. So basically, this Italian brand, what they did is giving a technology in the hands of the of sales advisor, making pressure to make sure they were using. So at that time, during this Chinese New Year, when you were entering their store, the sales advisor were playing with the app, okay, using it, and say, hello, yeah, welcome. Yeah, the last collection is here. Okay, if you need help, I'm here. Huh? But for the moment, you know what? I'm pleasing my CEO using the app, okay? And if you need me, I will be there, okay? So it is this technology, brilliant technology, working very well, killing the business just because it was not needed, and the pressure put on the sales advisor were disrupting them to make the business, to please the client, okay? So our advice to avoid this is to answer three questions. First one, do I need this technology? If the answer is yes, you ask a second one. Do I really need this technology? And the third question, do I really, really need this technology? And if you have three yes, you may start implementing it, okay? But you need three yes. Because most of the time, do I need this technology? You think about a very nice technology and you say, yes, I need it. Most of the time you don't need it. So a second worst uh, study, French fashion brand. Nobody is perfect, even French people, you can imagine. So a needed technology. Why a needed technology? Because this brand were 
having an amazing performance, okay, but not as fast as their traffic. This means their traffic were going up, but their, their business were not going as fast as their traffic. They had an issue with their conversion rate. Conversion rate, for those who are not in retail, is the number of people entering the boutique versus the number of people actually purchasing. They had a need to measure the conversion rate quite precisely to understand where to act, okay? So the conversion rate technology was much needed. Few weeks after that, they have very nice traffic counter linked to the cashier, and it was very uh, well implemented, was working very well, okay? Accurate, easy to understand, and so on. And for this French uh, brand, we are measuring their customer experience on a monthly basis. And what we notice on our hand is a drop in terms of attitude and behavior of the staff. Staff used to be quite nice, and their attitude were dropping a little bit, okay? And second things, the way they were welcoming the client, dropping a little bit, to a point where, during one of our survey, we understood that one sales advisor grabbed the hand of a young kid and yelled at him. You don't move, you stay here, okay? You stop running in the boutique. And we were in China. So China is a country where you have only one child. So you can imagine if the sales advisor is yelling at your unique child, what you do is you go away, you go on WeChat, and you make it a big story, okay? On Weibo or whatever, okay? So I had a lunch with this, um, with this uh, CEO of this uh, French brand in Asia Pacific, and I was saying to him, why is that? Why am, am I observing a drop in, in terms of attitude and behavior? Why you are not welcoming the guest anymore the way you, you will be doing? And the guy is, of course, a brilliant guy, and say, that's my mistake. I put a KPI, a bonus, on the conversion rate. And I ask them, if your conversion rate is increasing at store level, I give you a bonus. So what the sales advisor was doing, avoiding the entrance, because there is a store counter here, okay? So I'm a little bit distant from that. And the children going back and forth in front of the traffic counter, they are the issue, okay? And they would prefer going to lunch through the stock room, even if the fire alarm was ringing twice a day, rather than going through the, through the door, okay? So the technology was nice, okay? The implementation was easy to use. The way it was implemented was a disaster, okay? Not because of the technology, because of forgetting the impact that a wrong KPI to the wrong person linked to this technology will change your mindset, okay? And the technology, as Tariq mentioned, was used as a goal, not as a tool. A traffic counter is a tool, it's not the goal. The goal is not to increase the conversion rate. The goal is to please the customer, is to have a better business, okay? So again, a technology, brilliant technology, collapsing the business because the human factor and the implementation um, was going against the business. Third case, I'm quoting this brand because it's not a client of Albatros, okay? Um, so in this plane, going to Shanghai, okay? I was made aware about um, a kind of magic mirror, okay, that were available in a Forever Mark new boutique in Shanghai. So I was working on this presentation. I said, okay, let's go to see a nice technology with a magic mirror in a boutique, okay? And uh, of course, we are in China, so it was linked to a WeChat QR code, something amazing. I went to the website, and the CEO itself of the company publish uh, something about Libertem in a very nice shopping mall. It's the 1,000 Forever Max store in China, so it's for the uh, millennials and everything will be amazing. And basically, this store includes a number of innovative digital experience. There is a three dimension diamond wall and there is a magic mirror where a consumer can instantly share their favorite pieces with friends and family. So I talked to my, uh, my colleagues, say, let's go to the boutique, okay? And please meet Sophie, our country manager, who is uh, based in China, so she has WeChat. We were entering the boutique. We would like to try the magic mirror. The sales advisor asked her, ask her, 
which item do you like the most? She points at a, a nice pendant and says, this pendant, I like it very much. I would like to try it, the magic mirror with this item. Okay, you go live. She was scanning, installing the app, everything working extremely well, efficient, and so on. The magic mirror will take a picture. Three, two, one, zero. The picture is here. What you can see on the screen of the magic mirror is obviously the pendant that you choose and the picture that you just took. The only issue is that the picture shared is this one. What is missing? The pendant. OK? So their magic mirror announced by the CEO is a selfie stick. OK? So my, my, my colleague was very happy to have a picture of her in a boutique that she can share with friends and relatives. The third advisor didn't get the technology. They didn't understand that the pendant was to be worn in these things. And the magic of that is that in a shopping mall, their offices are upstairs. OK? So it's not at the end of China in Wulumuchi or in Hohot, OK? It's in Shanghai. They spend millions. The CEO is announcing that. The technology is working well. The only part missing is that the people who are using it, they don't get it. They probably receive a one-hour training. Probably this other was not here, trained by another guy. So here the message is uh, spend some time to explain technology to have the people grow in competencies and get why this technology is helping them to achieve their own target. If the technology is not helping them to achieve their own target, you will have forever marked stories day in, day out in your boutique. And also the message, it means that it works, doesn't mean in technology it is nicely used. It's two very different concepts, OK? So now let's move to best practices to understand how some of our clients are making the best of technology. So here it's, uh, again, an Italian brand, OK? We are having a lunch with them, and they ask two questions. What do we need in the context of our brand, brand today? They are asking that to a customer experience agency. And how we can implement it in a way that said advisor would like to use it. So we share our, our feelings on this brand. Say, your brand is very famous for the moment. Your digital presence is amazing. Most of the people entering your boutique, they already know what they want. The only thing they are worried about is, do you have it? OK? So basically, it's quite easy as a sales advisor to sell because the brand is so hot that people, as soon as the door is open, jump on it and try to get their sneakers or whatever, OK? So they ask us, what do we need in the brand today? And say, your role of the sales advisor is to create loyalty, is to share a feeling, is to deliver something on top of the product because you know what? Don't worry, the sales will happen, OK? So they think about that, OK, we need to share story, we need to create loyalty with our clients. And they come up a few, few months after that with a kind of internal Instagram that is working extremely well, which is basically working product category by product category to share with the sales advisor content not available in any other media that the sales advisor could share with the client when they are touching such kind of technology. And the brilliant thing of that is that there is no KPI to use it. There is no punishment. There is an avatar when you join as a sales advisor. You choose an avatar. And the more you use your app, and the better uh, the, your avatar is. Okay, so if you don't want to use your app, no problem. Okay, your avatar will look uh, very basic. If you use the app, if you pass certain exam, your avatar will become very uh, fancy. And guess what? You can share your avatar with the other service provider. And you know service provider better than I do. They are always in competition. They like to be the first. They like ranking. So if you have the best avatar in China, basically what? You know what? You are very happy. So they reinvent, uh, they start with this question in mind. What do I really need? I need my sales advisor to share stories relevant, not available in other media. Great. I develop a technology. I implement it in the way that, basically, it helps my sales advisor to tackle 
the current challenges of the brand, and a tool used with pleasure by the third advisor, with pleasure. Not with a KPI, if you don't use it, you are fired, but with pleasure. So it's a little bit more complex to put in place, but believe me, it's much more powerful. Another best practices coming from a, a French children brand, omni-channel strategy. So basically, the question they ask themselves is um, how we can use e-commerce website to boost retail sales? That's, of course, a, a big question. And how to break the silos between digital and brick mortgage. And they found a very uh, disruptive way to make sure that their e-commerce is driving business in retail. So it's in French. So let me translate it. So the brand is Jack Eddy. Again, it's not one of our clients, so I can quote the name. So livraison gratuite en magasin, it means that when you purchase on their e-commerce store, you have a free delivery in their shop. But you have to pay 25 dirham if you would like to have it at your place. A bit strange, not very customer-centric to have free delivery in boutique and 25 dirhams if you deliver uh, at your place. But guess what? They are doing that for Paris. Why for Paris? Because in Paris, they have boutiques everywhere the customer are. They are not in the 16th district because uh, Jacques Addy, uh, it's a mid-range, and here they prefer high range. They are not here part because in this part they prefer entry price. Okay, so basically they have boutiques everywhere their customer are working or living. So it's very convenient for a client to pick up in store. Okay, they are not making things so complicated. But the brilliant thing about their store delivery is that when you're a shop manager, you will receive the order taken online and the amazing performance they did on the parcel, they put what is inside. It's a white dress, three years old, for Mrs. Fromageau. My name is Fromageau, okay? So it's a white dress in three years old for Mrs. Fromageau. And the line below, it's written through that with the algorithm, what they have in stock and which is matching the white dress three years old. So when Mrs. Fromageau is arriving to pick up the good, the third advisor will welcome her. You are here to pick up your, your, the, the dress for your daughter? Yeah. Did you see the night sweater matching it? No. Here it is. You can deliver the parcel and the sweaters. And guess what? Between 30 to 66% of the time, you purchase another item. Just because it's written on the parcel what's in the inside and what the store have in stock that can match with what is inside. Okay, so it's again a technology which is, I guess, not something amazing to basically put what's in the inside and what the store have in stock matching it. But basically, it's a very nice way, it's a nice drive to store approach, okay, making it a little bit more expensive or free of charge, but you have stores everywhere, okay? It's a nice way to break the silos between e-commerce and store, okay, basically. And more important, e-commerce is not perceived as a competitor, but as a sales booster, okay? You have no idea about the number of boutique managers that spend their days to kill the e-commerce store of their own brand and find so many different excuses to tell to the clients, ah, yeah, our e-commerce, you know, I had a client last week, she, didn't, she received the goods uh, broken, so it's better if you buy it in my, in my boutique. And those kind of things, it's happening all the time. It's not measured by the brand, so when, normally, uh, when something is not measured by the brand, it does not exist, okay? But believe me, it's existing. Okay, so to conclude, methodology and conclusion regarding these worst cases and best practices, we need to remember um, the sentence from Steve Jobs, okay? Well, we can believe he's uh, successful and is a technology. You have to start with the customer experience and work back toward the technology, not the other way around. And when Steve Jobs is talking about customer experience, he's talking about sales advisor and clients and their interaction in retail, okay? So our recommendation for, uh, for success factor, again, implementing the technology because clients and sales advisors need it. 
not because it's the last one, not because it's trendy, not because it's famous, not because your competitor have it. The CRM tool of this Italian brand was launched because the CEO of this company was jealous about the CRM tool of their main competitor. 450,000 euros spent an emergency because the trigger was jealousy. Not needed, but jealousy, okay? The impact of technology on the retail working environment must be taken into consideration. Be careful with KPI, with bonus, with processes. You need to ask the question, what is the technology is going to change in my retail environment, okay? From a set advisor perspective. And the big success factor is retail team must be at the beginning and at the end of any retail technology project. Because guess what? The retail team will ensure the technology is easy to use. They don't want to have something wasting their time. They will make sure it goes fast, and they will make sure it is relevant, helping them. Okay? Last three things. In case of success and failure, it is rarely because of the technology itself. Rarely because of technology. Most of the time, when technology are developed, they are working very well. Success and failure come from basically whether or not it is relevant, whether or not the way it was implemented make it a success, and the added value it brings to human interaction. We are conducting every year a survey, and we ask to 300 people per country, is technology used by the set advisor bringing value? In China, 25% say doesn't bring value. In Singapore, 40% say the technology used by the Cevador do not bring value. In the US, 38% of the technology used by the Cevador do not bring value. It's not because of the technology, it's because of the content of the technology, okay? An average technology well used will always bring more business than an excellent technology with an average implementation. It's the same as strategy. You can replace strategy by technology. An average technology well used will always bring more business than an excellent technology with an average implementation. And last, we must develop retail team competencies. We must give a meaning when we implement technology in retail. Otherwise, day in, day out, you will have magic mirror with no uh, pendant on it, okay? So it's very important to basically understand that the team needs competencies. Shukran. Okay, guys. Um, this final session is about uh, retail technology and how it really affects us. So what I thought was I'd throw a few things in the air, and uh, as the panelist comes in, may I invite the panelists here across, please? These are some of the, the big trends that have been identified as far as, as retail is concerned, which is everything is faster, quicker, uh, omni-channel to omni-experience. This is another one of the key areas that we, we look at. And uh, getting in line with the millennial men mentality. What I mean by that is, that, you know, we know about millennials, and we all know that by the year 2025, 75% of the, of the workforce will be millennials. Everybody knows that? What people are forgetting, and if I had hair and if other people who had hair, uh, they'll recognize that actually uh, there's something else. 75% of the money spent or the spending power is with people over the age of 55. I call it the silver tsunami. And we forget the silver tsunami. We are so millennial focused that we forget the oldest. That's number one. And the second issue is our life expectancy is growing. And because our life expectancy is growing, we're not going to live till 80. We're going to live till 100. So you have these people for 40 years to sell to. Ignore them at your peril. Because I think the oldies are the ones who are going to spend most of the money. Seriously. It's just a, uh, just a thought. Can I just play a little video? This is from Forbes. It's a two-minute video. And uh, it talks about retail in the future, and that's a nice sort of backdrop uh, to our uh, esteemed guests. So enjoy this video.
let me start with a very, very open question. We live in a retail-rich environment. Uh, how soon are we seeing the changes happening? Because we have so much retail inventory and so much new retail inventory being built in our part of the world. Uh, Milesh, your best position for that. What do you see? What do you see by 2020, and then more importantly, uh, you know, a few years later after that? Retail is changing, of course, and uh, retailers have to rediscover, as a lot of times all of us has been saying, uh, the focus has to be more towards experientials. Uh, retailers who are reinventing their business models, like what we saw in your latest video of, of Best Buy, right? Best Buy now today is saying, okay, uh, you want to come to my store, uh, you want to try out my technology, okay, take it home, keep it, right? And we'll come and collect from you. Yeah, no problem if you don't need it, right? Best Buy is sending consultants to consumers' homes, right, to advise them on the right technology to buy. So retail is disrupted, will get consolidated. Retail will reinvent itself because it will become premium, as you rightly said, right? Theaters almost were dead and it, they came back. Mm -hmm. The same phenomenon I feel will happen in retail. Retail would take a more omni-channel presence. Like the latest study from Google and everybody that has come out says that about 60% of the people are yeah. using the digital means to actually explore, yeah. discover a product and then move on to the store to purchase, where they get the experience like Nilesh just mentioned. So, so before you continue, does it, uh, for normal people, do you know what an omni-channel experience is? Can you explain what an omni-channel experience when is, When we speak about omni-channel, that practically means that a store, a retail, has to give an experience across all kind of channels, which could be digital, physical, or experiential, could be social media as well. That's where a retail has to touch base with all its customers, and the com encompassing thing is called omni-channel retail. Thank now, you. When we speak about that, that's where things like digital, discovering a product, that comes in place. And that would also be where they're driven to more AI-based technologies, which could be Google Home, which could be Amazon Alexa. It could be all your you know, new technologies coming in place there. Uh, Omnichannel experience, I mean, amongst the mega trends that I was talking about, uh, we are going into, uh, into that space. Are we moving fast enough, Thibaut, in that direction? And you said something very interesting there average technology well executed versus great technology and not followed through. We, we are seeing a lot of conversation around technology, but how we talk, how much conversation is there around experience and, and what kind of people are we hiring for those, to deliver those experiences? Yeah, the, the, um, the topic about hiring people is, uh, is for us very important, okay? Because um, um, as, as you mentioned uh, in your introduction, the sales advisor in probably 10 to 12 years ago were trained on knowledge, okay? They had to uh, basically share a knowledge about the product, about the brand, whatever. And this knowledge now is given to the um, clients online or any, any other, other media. So basically what uh, our clients are doing and what we are advising our clients to do is to change the way they recruit people to basically understand that the customer journey has changed dramatically and what now the sales advisor needs to do is to basically uh, have this kind of five senses uh, interaction where they basically interact with ethics, with recommendation and those kind of things. So the job description of the sales advisor needs to be revised completely. The question we ask to sales advisor when we hire them needs to be completely different, not how much you know, but how much you care with uh, the people that are in front of you and how you can prove it. So from recruiting on uh, knowledge, we are going to recruit on behavior. Uh, and uh, knowledge will be uh, um, basically given uh, later. And after that, we're getting the speed of this uh, adaptation. Um, there are brands that are forced to be early adopter in any kind of technology, okay, by nature. And, but there are very few, I guess, in my opinion. Okay, and other brands need to basically think twice before embracing this and this technology. Otherwise, you can basically lose your, uh, what you are famous for or why the people choose you. All the people do not choose you because you are advanced in technology or advanced in different kind of things. They might choose you for different factors. So when choosing and implementing a technology, am I requested to be the first one to embrace that? 
And is this new technology relevant to my brand yeah. and basically will help me? And that's it. We look at the, uh, the overall supply chain um, and because there are a lot of engineers uh, in this group. So how are we, you know, this is an entrepreneurial environment, a startup environment. Do you think we're doing enough in terms of building the, the entire supply chain, the back end, whether it's payment systems, the fulfillment, or the process? Nilesh, would you like to answer? And then perhaps uh, we'll go to you, Rod. Yes. Yeah. Uh, as you know now, it's becoming a one-stop shop. So you cannot have one technology, you cannot have the other. But you need to make sure you have the right technology in your supply chain because the complexity nowadays is 10 times higher than it used to be back in the days. The Internet of Things was always implemented in the logistics, but nowadays, for example, you're retaining an inventory of 20, 30,000 SKUs. Back in the days, you had few players only who had that much inventory. So if you are not well equipped, if you don't have the right technology, if you didn't do a proof of concept for it, it's better not to implement it. This is how I see it. Are we innovative enough in our, in, in our entire supply chain, or are we just getting focused on, on key elements here and there? Okay, uh, we implemented just in time in 2005, right? It took a long time for, because we work with close to around 400 suppliers, mm -hmm. right, locally, right? 400 brands delivering, and we wanted just in time. That means you're selling in, I don't want to carry inventory right. more than two weeks, and yeah. it has to move in, move out, and multiple stores. So it's, it's, it, it, we have come a long way, right, uh, in terms of that. Technologies are available, RFID and other technologies are available. But unfortunately, the technologies are disjointed, right? I still cannot talk seamlessly to the system of all my 400 suppliers. Mm -hmm. That's the challenge, right? I have my system, I have the capability, but unless it connects with all my suppliers, yeah. and it becomes seamless. Yeah. So we still have a supply chain, following up with suppliers, calling them yeah. up, fill rates are down, you need to chase them up, uh, they make errors, you need to come in. So it's, it's still a lot of work in progress. How many people have seen Amazon Go? Uh, you've seen Amazon Go's video, a few people. But I think it's worth watching it again. And, and the reason I want to do that is that what seems like a frictionless experience and seamless to go going in and out, actually there's a whole series of activities in terms of facial recognition, technology, payment system, all of them happening simultaneously. And while she's setting it up, I'll share a, a fun story with you. Uh, our ruler here, Sheikh Mohammed, just one sec. Uh, Sheikh Mohammed uh, uh, gave a very hard time to the, uh, uh, to the CEO of Dubai airports about a couple of years ago, where he said, so why are people waiting uh, uh, in the immigration line? Why are people uh, waiting in the immigration line? And uh, we would like to bring it down to less than one minute. This is about three or four years ago. So everybody started working on trying to get uh, uh, iris recognition, IDs, etc., etc. Then about uh, uh, 18 months ago, his Highness show, saw this video at the World Government Summit. And within 48 hours, he pulled everybody in and he said, enough from your challenge in the next two years is that the, uh, at uh, Dubai airport, the wait time is zero. No wait time. 99% of the people walking through should are perfectly normal, decent people. We know enough about them before they get on board. We know enough about them as they're walking through. So why are we actually blocking them at one point? Why can't they just walk through? And this was the inspiration uh, to His Highness. And I think now can we play that? Because I think this is a really important one. Four years ago, we started to wonder. What would shopping look like if you could walk into a store, grab what you want, and just go? What if we could weave the most advanced machine learning, computer vision, and AI into the very fabric of a store so you never have to wait in line? No lines, no checkouts, no registers. Welcome to Amazon Go. Use the Amazon Go app to enter. Then put away your phone and start shopping. It's really that simple. Take whatever you like. Anything you pick up is automatically added to your virtual cart. If you change your mind about that cupcake, just put it back. Our technology will update your virtual cart automatically. So how does it work? 
we used computer vision, deep learning algorithms, and sensor fusion, much like you'd find in self-driving cars. We call it Just Walk Out Technology. Once you've got everything you want, you can just go. When you leave, our Just Walk Out technology adds up your virtual cart and charges your Amazon account. Your receipt is sent straight to the app, and you can keep going. Amazon Go. Fun, isn't it? But the technologies that go behind it, and we spoke about IoT, we, spoke about, we speak about computer vision, all the sensors, the payment systems and stuff. How are we integrating all of this? I mean, you're in a consulting uh, kind of environment. Do we have all the skills to pull this thing together? And how far are we from this? It's happening in Seattle, it's happening in other places. Why not Dubai? What is funny is that when you look at the, uh, uh, the things on Amazon Go, the day they opened, there was a huge line in front of the boutique to try the things. <laughs> 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 you, you just killed my presentation. Well, that's good. No, no, no. I no, love no, that. No, no, because it was what people were expecting. So yeah, they wanted yeah. to test it. Yes. No, no. And they, of course, they could not cope with probably 8,000 people yeah. who wanted to have uh, enter a small grocery shop. So yeah. it's, it means that. People want that, and they want seamless experience. What we are, uh, I think my point as a uh, consultant looking at 200 brands um, in our client's portfolio is that there are people that try, okay? Sometimes they fail, but sometimes they learn, okay? And those who are trying, okay? Uh, we are working, um, I will just quote this uh, brand because they were the first Burberry in the premium uh, 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 segment to put an, uh, an iPad, uh, an iPhone in their hands of their SaaS advisor. It was something like eight or nine years ago, all over the world and so on. They try, they fail. Mm. Why? Because the content on the app was exactly the same as the content on the web, of the website, but people were arriving. Did you see this video? Yes, 20 times. Ah, okay, thank you. But they are trying, okay, and now this kind of company that are trying, small by, uh, little by little, are more advanced than the other one. What we believe in that is same as e-commerce, same as the other things. You may try a little bit, but you are in. You are not out, you are in. So maybe you are not perfect, but you have a team, you have a PNL, you have uh, uh, people testing it, okay? And how fast you, you go, it's basically based on the skills you have in your company. But what, for us, what technology and what all the things are, are, are telling our clients is, did you try, okay? How many times did you try? And are you a kind of people that are afraid about that and basically say no because in your own uh, history you didn't use technology or you didn't want to have it so you are against that or do you have like a, a Accor Hotel they have a you know this shadow executive committee with people below 30 years old which are basically validating or not the decision of the big board are you a kind of company that is basically open to change and testing okay we believe in pilot we, we okay. believe in small things, same as Amazon. They are publishing a video worldwide. Yeah. It's one shop in Seattle for the moment. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes, Nilesh, quickly. Yeah. Okay, uh, let me add. This is the future, right? Yeah. But there are a lot of challenges in physical retail which needs to be solved, right? But is it the future? Because this has already been launched. And if, and if we are talking about Moore's Law, then this thing is going to double in the yeah, next months. Yeah, but you know, the big, there are challenges bigger than this, right, okay. in the existing retail, right? Why? Because when a consumer is walking into a physical retail, what is, what is his expectations, right? Yeah. First expectation is, whatever I searched online, I need to see the same information inside Fair the enough. store. We spoke of about omnichannel, right? Yes. So that yeah. means your supply chain has to get more integrated, right? Yeah. Point number two, what price I saw online, I need to see it in the same. So right now what we are doing is we are integ integrating our web and moving into digital fact tags. Okay. Connecting. That means the same content, so we have developed our information hub where if you do one ERP change in terms of information and price, it has to reflect seamlessly everywhere, whether it's yeah. a web, app, inside the store, right? Second, he needs to find that item there because why does a person walk into the store? Apart from touch and feel, he does not want to be in a situation where you say, sorry, it is, I'm stuck out, right? Mm -hmm. So how do I do a predictive analytics and, and based on who is walking in, what I'm selling, I ensure that when you walk in, 99.9% .9 the product is available. Now, these are the bigger challenges where you'll have to solve in the supply chain, your forecasting, your predictive analytics, before you reach this to this point. Thanks. We have to solve some of the basics. Absolutely. A quick comment, uh, Pradha? Just to add to what Nilesh had earlier mentioned when he was in his keynote speech, 
was the fact that the retail when a customer walks in is free for the customer. He's not signed up. Anyway, when we are talking about a walk-in and walk-go, it's good if we are looking at it more on a convenience store level. But when we are talking about more on a bigger scale and talking about like multiple retailers having their checkout and walk-in, walk-out uh, stores, just as you go technology, it becomes more difficult because that many more stores need to have apps on your phone. That many more people will have to, you know, check. Uh, you have to register with every single retailer, get onto their loyalty rewards. That is where it becomes a challenge. Now, getting a customer, hanging onto the customer, and engaging a customer, those are three very different aspects in a digital uh, uh, space. Secondly, when I say about Amazon Go, they actually have started out as a prototype. They took 18 months before they went to public. The store was there. I actually walked up to the store and was not allowed to go inside. So they said it's just open to Amazon employees. That was like 10 months ago. So they opened six months ago. They had issues. They have still got an error rate of about 2%. Now, when you're talking about grocery retail, 2% is a huge impact on your margins. Amazon is taking that cost because it's a prototype. How they scale it up, you still have to see. And again, scaling up from one store is there. But if you have 100 stores who are doing the same thing, will you carry 100 different apps to check in and check out? That's the next challenge to do. Great, thank you. I'll uh, ask a, another couple of questions, and then uh, we'll open it to the audience. Uh, one of them uh, which keeps coming up is, is the word uh, shared economy. Uh, how is the shared economy uh, going to, to affect the retail environment? Uh, and then let me uh, qu qualify with that. Um, so if I'm, uh, I don't know, if I want to b get a canoe or something like that, or, or any kind of special equipment or uh, technology, in, in, in your case, uh, providing product, uh, do you feel that there could be heavy competition to the retail store by putting the Uber or the Airbnb for shared computers, shared uh, laptops, shared uh, cameras everywhere because, you know, we don't use any of our product more than around 10% of the time. So it's sit sitting idle for 90% 90 90 of the time. Uh, whether it's our car, whether it's a, how, if we start getting into that shared economy, how does that impact retail? Or is the retail engaging ahead and sort of saying we're expecting the shared economy, so we are now creating that, uh, that, that whole process. I, have I articulated it that properly? Have you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, so anybody? Uh, yeah, we had uh, this year um, <laughs> two focus in our uh, yearly study. One is renting versus owning. Okay. And the other one was purchasing secondhand versus purchasing new. Okay. And the results we had all over the world was pretty spread out by nationality. Okay. For example, Chinese, they will not like purchasing secondhand. It gives bad luck. They are afraid to purchase from dead people. Brings bad luck. So sometimes you could have the best technology, best offer, second-hand products in, uh, in China. There is a strong barrier in mind. Okay? In the US, amazing business. And renting versus owning, again in China, that will be uh, the future. In the US, 49% of our respondents said, I would consider seriously renting versus owning. Okay? And in luxury fields, okay, for watches, for handbags, and so on, you already has very nice player. And we do believe, and Caring Group is working on it, to be a client of a brand by subscription. You are going to pay a fees per quarter or per year to be a client of Prada, of Hermes, of Gucci, of uh, IWC Rolex. And this subscription will give you uh, some, uh, some access to certain products basically on the price of you pay a subscription. So we do believe that uh, renting versus owning is something that the brand needs to look at. And purchasing secondhand versus purchasing um, new, it will happen also uh, because of millennials also uh, that are more into a saving environment and so on. But be careful of the um, nationality split for uh, uh, secondhand product. Uh, fair comment. Uh, just a quick comment, and then I uh, will start the audience. Uh, questions? Anybody else? Uh, shared economy, is it going to affect you guys? Rod, is it going to affect your business? This is the future of the economy. This is how I see it. Right. And it's a must to keep on promoting it. Because if you look at the millennials, this is all what they like to do at this okay. point. They don't like the conventional and the traditional 
way of doing business. And my main role is today is just to make sure to cultivate a culture among our customers to go and to think about outsourcing and about the shared economy. We have an obstacle, a main challenge, which is the cultural background. Some nationalities, they don't like outsourcing, they don't like the sharing, they like to own the product. Yeah. And this is our job to show them that it's going to be much more profitable, much more easier, and much more, more reliable to go into a shared economy model. One question to you, a rhetorical question. Uh, I'll come to you now. A uh, rhetorical question. How many people in, uh, in this room uh, have a degree in psychology? Zero. Um, oh, one. She's a and, and she's a photographer because she's actually engaging. How many people in this room have a degree or a qualification in anthropology? Zero. How many people in this room have some kind of a quali qualification, understanding, in-depth research in ethics? Zero. Uh, there's a gentleman right at the back. Uh, he has a degree in ethics. We just don't study these things anymore. And what the, all of the, the people here said, oh, it's cultural. Who understands cultural? So if you've got young kids, ask them to go for uh, ethics and anthropology degrees. If you're older yourself, please go and take something yourself because that will give you muscles that you don't currently have. And I think it's going to really, really help the retail sector because actually at the end of the day, it's about that human connection that comes in. All right, so that's, sorry, I got into speech mode. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Just carrying on from that, actually talking about ethics. One of the issues that I haven't really seen discussed today is that of sustainability. Brilliant. Spoken yeah. of getting in tune with a millennial mindset. That's yes. very important for the millennials, as we know, as yeah. for many of the rest of us. Um, is sustainability uh, a trend? I mean, you haven't mentioned it. And if so, where are we going to see that in the future? Uh, being in an industry where we generate a lot of electronic waste, right, to start with, right? So uh, we, we are trying to work on sustainability. First of all, all our stores are getting converted into LED, right, because to, to save power. And, and say, so we invested in LED technology so that all our stores, what you see, the new stores being built is built with LED. We are moving into solar. Okay, my Times, our Times Square store is already gone into, into solar, so we are offsetting. Then we are getting into, uh, we are working on packaging where we get into biodegradable plastics, right? Uh, we are going, uh, we have in, introduced applications where uh, we, we, we are trying to become paperless, right? So like what we have done is we, we took an application called Fresh Desk where my complete customer care department, some hundred odd people, have become paperless. That means each transaction gets converted into a ticket, and then, then you have the analytics, and you, you run like this. So th then comes the, in terms of electronic waste, yes, we, we work with Dubai municipal, municipality to con collect electronic waste, right, and, uh, and then, you know, uh, responsibly then dispose of it. But that's a starting point, but ideally, we'd like to see where, to come to a stage where people willingly bring this waste out of their house because we keep a lot of our stuff which we don't use anymore, but we still keep it in the house, right? Okay, and or we dump it off, right? A lot of us don't know how to dump these products. So we really uh, take, take further steps in terms of awareness and in terms of how this waste can be collected and how the waste can be responsibly used or recycled. Uh, Thibo, you said that uh, you uh, consult with the 200 companies. Do you find that sustainability is something that they are conscious or is it just a little CSR activity that they like to do on a PR basis? So yeah, there is, there is brands that are afraid about that, and yeah. there are brands that are willing to uh, be a leader. Okay, we work uh, a lot with the Caring Group, and Caring Group, you know, they are very advanced in that. They are most of the time in the top five player in the sustainability, and they are a part of our client's portfolio that are afraid about that. Yeah. They are working diamond. Very afraid about that in diamond, because in diamond, you cannot imagine the the, the, the impact on the, on the planet to uh, basically take out from Earth uh, a small piece like that, and it's uh, terrible for the planet. So what is happening in their industry is that you have now what they call grown live diamond. What I learned recently is that a diamond, it's carbon that you can find everywhere in the world with pressure and temperature. So carbon is free of charge, you have it in the air, and what you need is pressure and temperature. So now there is company in India, in, in the US, that are basically with a machine creating 
perfect diamond that nobody can notice the difference between someone, a diamond coming from the hearse and diamond coming from a lab, okay? And it's a big stress for the uh, diamond industry because for sure the millennials, if they are in front of a window display, grown live diamond, real diamond, natural diamond, 40% less full price. What's your choice? You have a, a diamond with no blood in it. You know the blood diamond, what happened to De Beers a couple of years ago. You have a diamond which is saving nature, which is costing 40% less. Or you have the natural diamond, full price. You don't even know it's, it's basically kill uh, African people or whatever, yeah. and so on. So here in the can of sustainability, there is some part of the industry where they will be for sure hit big time in the, in the, in the coming years because of this angle of sustainability and people will not be willing to, s to basically purchasing exactly the same. This has no impact on our planet and this has an impact on our planet. Uh, I, I will go for that. We'll uh, that thank happens. you, Thibault. I, I, all the women I've ever known, uh, try giving them a fake diamond which is 40% cheaper. Uh, doesn't work. Uh, so, uh, so I think the point I'm trying to say is that there's a, a behavioral shift that needs to click in before all of these elements of sustainability start kicking in. But a quick comment, uh, so can get Quick point on this. Uh, sustainability was one of the key motivators when we started Clip the Deal. We actually wanted, so one of the big things what Clip the Deal does is it publishes deals directly from brands and for grocery space. Now, if you look at the grocery space, you look at any retail, you see loads of these pamphlets that are distributed, like in millions. It costs money, it, it leads to a lot of use of paper, so that's where Clip the Deal, when we started looking at it, we said it's going to be completely digital, putting up deals. So that's where, for us, it was very important that we cut down on that waste, if we say, paper that is being used in it. Secondly, as we have gone along over the last three years, one of the steps that we have taken is we have completely digitized everything, every single process. So our company is practically, on our side, paper-free. There's no paper, even if it's an invoice, it is all digital. So it's as simple as that. We have just ensured that we are working towards that. Great. And again, it's important for us as a generation. That's Thank you. Uh, we have a question here. A uh, quick question, please. Yeah. Uh, good morning. My Stand name up. is Badal. We, we, uh, I'm a part of Pearl Quest. Uh, we run uh, this company with virtual reality and interactive technologies and a little bit of smart retail. My question is to Mr. Nilesh. Uh, you said 90% of retail is still brick and mortar. And in this scenario is definitely changing with uh, more bandwidth and uh, my question is with with technologies like VR the whole retail landscape seems to change because the what you said how a customer gets engaged uh, with all his senses currently uh, in an e-commerce space it's only visual but with VR it is going to be even more like you can actually feel you're walking into the store and you can pick up a product and uh, you know almost it's almost as close to reality so do you see this as a opportunity or as a threat uh, to the overall uh, ecosystem definitely it's a promising technology right uh, but it's it has got a way to go because uh, again i said five senses right retail is is is, is, is has to be five senses right so it, it has to way to go to, to develop those five senses. But it's an opportunity for us is, is if customer is able to experience in a virtual world and then comes to our store, right, and, and, and buy, right? So it's, it's an, a definitely an opportunity for us because then when you work with technology, as I said earlier, it becomes uh, more simpler than working with humans, right? I, I face bigger challenges with humans because they have an emotion, they have a mind of their own. Right? And if you want to train a human, like what we are trying to do right now, we are using an application to gamify and, and understand their behavior and how and then knowledge and what we want them to do, right? So we have, we have, we have launched an app which, which currently is being piloted in our Dera City Center stores where 50 sales executives are playing that game. And that game motivates them and then we understand how this, this person will behave when, when we put him. It's like a simulator, right? There's another uh, thing what we are doing with the salespeople is there is another AI-based app which we have. It is called Infido, which pings my uh, employees to understand their emotions, right? So it, it, it says, oh, you have completed one year. How do you feel, right? And based on that, it, it's a chat app, and then the employees chat, and then 
it gives us an indication of who is happy, who is not happy, what is the emotion, and top three things which the organization needs to do, which is, which is, which is affecting the emotions. So yes, it's a promising uh, technology, and it's an opportunity for us, but then it has to get developed further. Thank you. Sir. Yes, uh, good morning. Um, <laughs> the, there was a question on uh, uh, the, the fact that all organizations need to uh, continue their quest for customer experience and that customer engagement and having that quality of engagement that's going to continue in generating loyalty. Now, if you take the, the loyalty curve in, in conjunction with that service going up by all organizations, uh, how do you see uh, that involvement of customer loyalty and that continuation of, of customer always coming back, um, bearing in mind that everyone is trying to, to get onto that uh, experience curve that everybody wants to get to? Um, but then, do you want to talk about that? I mean, customer loyalty at the moment, uh, are we actually very loyal anymore? I, um, now, uh, it, it's a question that the unit has different answers to it because it has different people have different opinions. But if we talk about customers are not very loyal as we speak, they will just go for one, good deals. The other is good experiences. So either it's price or experience that people go for. And that's where, if you have to continuously define and actually deliver on it. So Nilesh touched on it earlier. He said that on products, we have to meet uh, the price which is being offered by online players, right? So that shows that the loyalty towards buying has moved towards the price. It's not, you. I find the best price online, I'll go and buy it there. If I find it in store, you price match guarantee, I'll go and buy it in store. So loyalty that way is shifting. But only place where Tewa comes in is at the great, uh, what we say, luxury brands where experience matters. Now, luxury retail will continues to be more focused towards offline physical stores because it's all about experience there. So loyalty will have has different answers for different people there. Uh, is it about experiences or is it about the influencer who tells you what to go and buy? So it's not about the experience, it's about the experience with the influencer. Ma'am, why don't you ask a question? forecasting um, I've heard you guys talk about uh, millennials a lot but there's generation Z coming afterwards there's baby boomers and the others which I don't know up front and all these people have adopted technology I'm just interested to know like when you're preparing your business models do you just um, make models specific to millennials which probably most people here fall in or do you consider Generation Z uh, and other people who've come before, especially in technology, like uh, when you're coming up with new technological ideas or when you're doing things in Sharf DG, who's your big market and what's the purchasing power? How do you forecast and say, this is what I'm going to have in the store because this age group can buy more? Do you understand? Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the depth of uh, forecasting and analysis, okay. I mean, we have so much going on. I'll be honest, uh, uh, today uh, we, are, we have just Sorry. moved into the how do we forecast. Usually our industry used to forecast based on past sales, right? But especially this year we saw a complete change when VAT was introduced in December, where December sales were almost, December sales were almost for two months, right? So the sales just spiked. And then January, the sales went down by, the whole industry went down by 36, 40%, right? So again, how do you forecast in these kind of, of scenarios, right? So generally, the industry takes the past data and tries to forecast, right? But now, we are moving into it, especially retailers like us, we are moving into the customer lifetime value concept. That means whatever purchases the consumer has made, right? We know what you have bought from us in the last four or five years, and then we are trying to mine the data. We have not reached and perfected it, but we are, we are still in the, in, the, in the process of perfecting of how do we forecast based on, on who you are, what you have bought right, from, from us, and, and how do I predict what you will buy, right? Because even, even the biggest of companies, like I was in the Intel conference, uh, they, they also don't have an idea, because their research is, is, is saying that, I don't know whether you'll believe it or not, but the fact has come out as, that consumers take seven years to replace their laptop. Seven years worldwide. Can you imagine? We replace cars here in two years, right? Three years. 
They're taking seven years. <coughs> now, how do you forecast that? And, and they don't, they don't, they, they are really, re really, they have hit the ceiling and they'd say, I don't know what to do, right? Because their business is to sell more wafers. And he says, if customers are taking seven years, oh man, I, I don't know, right? So right. this is how the industry is. Yes, we are from technology industry, but we, we really don't understand the consumer because we have been selling products. And now we have said, look, we need to understand the consumer in more detail right. of who he is, who she is, and, and, and how does she or he behaves. Thank you. Thanks, Nilesh. Quick comment. Quick question here, and one last one, and then we close. Okay. Please. My question to Nilesh and Thibaut, uh, based on your experiences, we know in uh, Dubai and the UAE, the retail uh, industry has been very difficult to change and to adopt startups and open to adopting new technologies in their uh, retail uh, operations. But I think now it's the right time, actually, because we, we see a we see them more open uh, based on market condition to adopt these new technologies. So my question is what advice you give based on your, experience, based on your experiences to corporates to have a more open culture toward welcoming these new technologies and to work with startups? And what advice you give to startups to have the right attitude in working with corporates? Because sometimes this can be the, where the conflict can uh, start and uh, uh, the work can take place between both of them. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, so I, I will answer from a customer experience point of view agency. Um, we are a global company, so we measure customer experience all over the world. Okay? What we are observing in the Middle East and we are not observing in the other part of the world is two things. First, we ask the clients of the brand how happy you are with Sharaf DG experience. And they give us a certain answer. And then we ask the salespeople, how do you think your clients are happy about your experience, okay? In the Middle East, it is the region where there is the highest unconscious incompetence. Meaning that the people, the Southern Rider, believe that they are doing an amazing job, but when we ask the clients, there is a huge gap. There is two countries where the opposite, it's Korea and Japan, okay? But in the Middle East, people, Southern Rider, okay, we are doing thousands of evaluation on a yearly basis, believe that they are creating more or less 80% of very satisfied clients, but the reality is between 35 to 40%. So first, we need to take care of the people, telling them where they are in terms of customer experience and how they treat people in the retail. And based on that, technology will help. Okay? And when we understand where we need a tool to cope with the difference between clients' expectation and what is delivered right now, right now then the technology will be arriving spot on to tackle the issue, okay? But uh, there is this gap to understand uh, between people that are claiming that they are doing an amazing job in customer experience, the traffic is very well optimized, and everything is doing smoothly, and you ask the people the same questions, and you have a 100% uh, gap between 40% and 80%. Thank you. Good morning, uh, thank you uh, so much. My name is Rami, I'm from a company called My Bazaar. My question is more on this omni-channel retailing and what needs to happen. I, I see a lot of the big retail houses here. Um, they jump into online. We have to get online. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I think our sales are going uh, you know, south because of online, and they're stealing. And, and um, that's not really, well, we're not really sure if that's the case. But what they have is the advantage of having physical stores. Uh, so what's, kind of, what's going to be the evolution? What needs to be the evolution of, of this online, offline experience? And, and you hear terms such as, uh, clicks to bricks and, and, and online to offline and all that kind of stuff. What can they do to leverage this more? And, and it seems right now, uh, Nilesh just talked about integrating his online with his offline, but what's the next step? What has to happen more to really leverage that to actually make it an advantage, not just to have these two kind of silo businesses happening because so they feel like they need to. A quick snap response on the next step because we're running out of time actually. Yeah, yeah so the next step is, is we expect consumers to do their research online because today the data is showing 40% of our consumers who are walking into our stores do their research online and then walk into the stores. But we are not doing the job good enough to give them the, the, the best of the experience. So what we expect them when they walk into our stores is the product should be available and I should get an excellent demo or where I'm able to test drive a product and take a decision with, and then and, and walk off. Right? Okay. That is how will be the next evolution. We are in a startup environment, an entrepreneurial environment, so I'll just ask a quick one minute, I mean a 10 second response from each one of you. If you guys had a, a million dollars, 
right now to just literally throw away, which one space would you invest in? Because a lot of people here are, are startups and so on. What, what would that be one industry that you would you know, just throw in at an early stage, uh, $1 million? Yeah, Grume right. Hub, shared economy. Shared economy, uh, app to kill the retail industry by sharing every stuff and creating a new space. Brilliant, thank you, sir. I don't have one. Uh, oh. I don't have one. I have actually Sleep two. Being uh. in the startup hub right here, so that's <laughs> what I can tell you. One is big data. For me, that's simple. You put money into it, you customize products for your customer, and you get it done. The other would be get a good P2P wallet, payment wallet, to get a good payment system in place country, there's certain regulations around it, it's not allowed. It's only within one bank or something, but a good P2P wallet is something which is required for online e-commerce to benefit us. Well. Sure. Okay, super, sir. Yeah, I need a technology to engage my frontline employees because the experience and the engagement, uh, we, if they enhance, the, um, our results depend on that because today I have no means. I can only see sales from the store. So and I need an app which can engage with my frontline employees and improve the experience inside the store. So that is what I would like to invest. Yesterday. Sir. Yesterday, okay, yes sir. So yeah, um, I will take a similar answer as uh, Linish. Um, I will invite in, uh, in profiling. I will invite, uh, invest, sorry, in a, in a technology that basically uh, understand the human interaction and make it more smooth. The, 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 uh, the, 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 the mindset of our company is to transform a transactional moment yeah. into an emotional and relationship moment. Yeah. So I will invest in a, in a technology that creates loyalty. Brilliant. I will uh, uh, work with these two gentlemen and create the non-technology environment for the emotion and the human connection part. Because I think we keep forgetting that and the only reason all of you folks come to a place like this, you can get more information on the net than you got what you got here. But you come in because you connect. We are social beings, and we need to be able to start looking at those new areas and hire psychologists and people like that in the soft skills. And I think reinforcement technology, that human part, uh, part, I think will define our future. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. I'm sorry we didn't get good. Go on. <laughs>